Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Download, coming to you live from our church world headquarters here in the Archdiocese of Detroit. Today is May 13th, Feast of uh, or anniversary of Our Lady of Fatima. That's what this wonderful statue and rosary here is on our desk for. Last Thursday, Pope Francis disappointed the laity in large fashion. He issued his long-anticipated document on what the church would do about homo predator bishops and clergy and other bishops who cover up for them. His new norms have fallen way short of how to deal with these despicable men, men who are successors of the apostles, who have lied and deceived, they've participated in the destruction of souls and bodies, and men who have aided and abetted all of this monstrous evil by their silence. The upshot, the only part that matters, is that the bishops will, we've heard this term before, investigate themselves. No call for law enforcement to be informed, no call for panels of lay investigators. The bishops will continue to get off scot-free in this life, so as long as they have a buddy brother bishop who likes them and is sympathetic to them or could be implicated himself, if he were to expose their rot, things will go along just as usual. Today, Stephen's going to go over the actual document and its rather ironic title. Christine will examine the glaring deficiencies in it, and glaring is a kind word, and Simon will present to us what should have been done, which this plan doesn't even come close to approaching. Stephen. Uh, really, this is a, uh, you know, you, you are the children of the light, right, you're the light right, of the right. world, yep, please. Yep, new proprio, new norms, problem solved, right? All done. Um, <clears throat> yes, on uh, last Thursday, Pope Francis issued a, a new motu proprio uh, titled Vos Estiques Lux, uh, Lux Mundi, or You Are the Light of the World, uh, referring, <coughs> <Not>. to the, <laughs> referring to the bishops. <laughs> now, this, uh, the, the motu proprio contains new norms for handling clerical sex abuse. Um, now, it's being praised in certain, you know, establishment corners of the church, of course, but slammed as deficient in many others. Now, on the positive side, the motu proprio extends protections to seminarians and religious forced to or coerced uh, into sexual activity by their superiors, elevating this to uh, really the same category as abuse of minors and vulnerable adults. So that's good. But looking closer, its deficiencies quickly emerge. You know, Christine will delve more deeply into the specifics here, but let's examine one fundamental problem. The new norms actually empower the bishops, putting the Metropolitan in charge of investigating all allegations of, of uh, sex abuse. It basically, in other words, it, it allows them to self-police, and we know they can't be trusted to do so. Um, Article 10 of the Motu Proprio lays out the initial duties of the Metropolitan. It says this, quote, Unless the report is manifestly unfounded, the Metropolitan immediately requests from the competent dicastery that he be assigned to commence the investigation. If the Metropolitan considers the report manifestly unfounded, he shall so inform the pontifical representative. Now, note that clause, unless the report is manifestly unfounded. Well, who decides that? Who yeah. makes that determination? Well, the, the Metropolitan himself. And, you know, the, the, the bishops have a decades-long track record of covering for predator priests, and this clause gives them the first and final say over whether the, a, 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 an investigation will proceed at all. Uh, and only if an allegation reaches law enforcement and or media, can, as well as the Metropolitan, can we be guaranteed that uh, the, the merits of an allegation would be honestly evaluated. Uh, so the, the, the new norms also, they don't direct that. They don't direct clergy to report allegations to law enforcement or to media. So the, the, the motu proprio really has to be evalua evaluated closely uh, against the backdrop of the bishop's track record a appalling track record, and when it is, it's exposed really as little more than a smokescreen uh, for business as usual at best. Yeah, I mean it's crazy. You know that that you know the the directive is here. You investigate your friends, and you determine if the charges against your friends are worthy of pursuing or not. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, I graduated with you. We were at the NAC together. Right. Uh, your brother bishop is a friend of my guy over there. Oh, by the way, you're. Oh, my, by the way, you know what? You got some dirt on me from that guy I was dating in seminary. Mm -hmm. I mean, exactly. come on. It's just so pathetic. It it, really it's is. so pathetic on the face of it. Yeah. I, I don't know how you can even, I mean, but you know, the bad guys, this was the subject of today's vortex, they got everything they wanted here. They really did. I mean, just as a recap here, this, the, this new motu proprio is really the culmination of almost a year of shocking and disturbing revelations about the church, beginning with 
the McCarrick revelation back of, in June of last year of the, of the um, allegations of homosexual you know, abuse of this 16-year-old ultra boy, his suspension, one of the most powerful cardinals in the American church, followed by the bombshell Pennsylvania grand jury report, which then followed you know, a great deal of pressure on Cardinal Rural to step down, which he eventually did, followed by the, the even more shocking testimony of Archbishop Vigano exposing a homosexual network within the church, complicit clergy, shielding McCarrick and other people like him, followed by multiple state attorneys general launching multiple investigations all over the country into sex abuse in their uh, you know, states, and then rumblings of RICO, federal investigations now, all of that. And then, of course, you have the Baltimore meeting where nothing was accomplished with regard to sex abuse except for one document on racism, followed by the sex summit, which was like, you know, a dog and pony show. Again, mm -hmm. nothing was accomplished. So this motu proprio was supposed to be the final answer to all of that. And what, what do we have? We basically have nothing. I mean, Catholics should be outraged. And no bishop should be praising this. It's ridiculous. Secular media is praising it. Father Martin, all these people saying, oh, it's a great step forward. It's not. Be precisely, because, precisely because it allows the bishops to investigate themselves. Just putting it in stark terms here. If these norms were in place at the time that Cardinal McCarrick was in D.C., he would have been the Metropolitan Archbishop in charge of overseeing sex abuse investigations over bishops in his jurisdiction. The same man who himself was abusing multiple seminarians he would have been in charge. You know, give me a break. It's pathetic. Like, like he was in charge in the 2002 Dallas Charter. Exactly. Yeah. He was the guy that was in charge. I mean, there, <laughs> what has changed? Nothing. Nothing has changed. I mean, all this does is just, I don't know if this particularly codifies it in canon law or not, but it certainly codifies it as far as the practical lived life of the church mm -hmm. when this happens. How is this different than putting McCarrick in charge of the Dallas Charter in 2002? There's nothing, nothing, like I said, nothing has changed. Cardinal Supich right now would be the Metropolitan. This is the same man who threw his own priest under the bus, Father Kalchik, one day after he got a letter from Lori Lightfoot, who's the openly lesbian mayor of Chicago, demanding swift action be taken against Father Kalchik for burning that LGBT flag. One day after receiving that letter, Kalchik has run out of his diocese and he's still in hiding now. This is the man who would be in charge of sex abuse investigation, homosexual sex abuse investigation. But keep in mind, it really is nothing more than an adoption of the rural alternate sex abuse proposal that Supich championed last year. And we know that the, both Supich and Whirl were colluding on this in the weeks before the Baltimore conference because they were spotted at the NAC together constantly. And then they were spotted dining together at the Baltimore meeting, dining with Archbishop Pierre, conferring with him privately. Pierre gets up there and announces, no laity exactly what the new, these norms say, and basically bishops get to investigate themselves, exactly what these norms say. But recall, that last year, Father Rosica gave a fawning interview to Cardinal World. By the way, Rosica has removed that uh, video from his site. Can't find it anywhere, but we have a copy. We have it. <laughs> we have a copy. <laughs> but in this interview with World, this is where World says, oh, just let, let the bishops investigate themselves. Let's go ahead and roll that. Why don't we take from our conference a number of bishops from different committees to work with and invite the National Review Board to join them. So now we have a permanent body, and if someone has an accusation they want to bring, they can bring it there. That's it, they can bring it there, they can bring and it we'll there solve And it. have their entire career ruined <laughs> for doing so, which means they won't do it. So people need to understand, the powers that are given to the Metropolitan are near total. In the beginning, if a report's brought to him and he determines that the report's not credible, he can just drop it on his own determination. He can just drop the investigation. Nothing's ever done. Um, in the case of McCarrick, let's say, hypothetically, if he's a metropolitan, and a seminarian that he himself has abused brings a report. Now, the new norms do allow, in the, pla in the place of a conflict of interest, they can appoint a different bishop to oversee it. But who? You know, a bishop in the pocket of McCarrick in the same jurisdiction? Who knows that there's going to be severe backlash to his career if he exposes McCarrick through his investigation? Give me a break. This is a joke. And like I said, Supich, of course, he's praising this because essentially these are the norms that he himself proposed. Uh, but recall in, in Baltimore last year, he seemed to be the only cardinal that was not surprised and not caught off guard after Archbishop Christophe Pierre, the papal nuncio, announced to everyone in the audience that there would be no lay investigation, et cetera. There was an audible gasp in the room when he said that. Supich, however, not from him, he was up on his feet, immediately praising the Pope for this. Let's go ahead and take a look. 
Brothers, I am sure that you have concerns about this latest development, as I do myself. Rather than addressing those at this moment, let us start by bringing them to the Lord in prayer and seeking his wisdom for our response. In that way, we can be assured that the Holy Spirit may be present in our discussions and guide them when we turn to business on Tuesday. Uh, uh, yes, Cardinal Subic. It is clear that the Holy See is taking seriously the abuse crisis in the church, seeing it as a watershed moment, not just for the church in this country, but around the world, in putting so much emphasis on the February meeting. At the same time, as you are our representative going to that meeting, we need to be very clear with you where we stand, and we need to tell our people where we stand. And so I would suggest that we carry on our discussions on these documents, that we fine-tune them through our understanding, debate, and the ways that amendments can be proposed, and that instead of taking a binding vote as an action item, we take a resolution ballot so that we can communicate to you as you go to that meeting representing us where we stand and what we need to say in that discussion. For a bishop who had just supposedly heard the letter, my goodness, isn't that a well thought out uh, plan? He yeah. had no advance notice of that. He just stands up there and has points. One, two, three, four, five. Let's do all of this, okay? I just thought of all that. No, yeah. he, he absolutely knew. <laughs> right, that's amazing. Uh, now, I'd say the one difference, significant difference between the world proposal and the Pope's new norms is that adults, adult seminarians and religious are included in the same criminal class as minors, which is something that many victims' rights advocates were clamoring for because, of course, the Dallas Charter does not in any way mention adults. It talks about people under age 18. So that was added kind of as, a, I guess, throwing a bone to that crowd. But again, they're subjected to the authority of the Metropolitan. So, you know, and then the Metropolitan reports his findings to Rome. And, uh, I mean... Really. So, so let's examine that change, the, the, the bone. Let's look at that. Okay, so case A, 15-year-old uh, comes and reports Bishop blah, blah, tried to do something sexual to him. That goes straight to the Metropolitan. Okay, Bishop B, uh, seminarian reports that Bishop or Rector blah, blah, tried to do something sexual to him. That goes to the Metropolitan. They all wind up yeah, on the exactly. desk of the Metropolitan. Mm -hmm. And the Metropolitan doesn't care if it's a 16 year or 14 year old, or unless it's a crime, in, in, when, you know, it, it, the statute of limitations hasn't run out, then he cares because of you know, going to jail, uh, and, or the seminarian. What's the difference? The same guy is exactly. deciding. So yeah. this is just kind of, I, I'm sorry, that whole thing about you've added the seminaries, you've added the seminarians into a pot that is you know, unjust and there's no guarantee what they're gonna be saying yeah. is being heard. And recall too that Supich actually resisted the idea of adding adults because he said, oh, that's, that's a different skill set, involves different things because you know, consensual, et cetera. This is what he said in Baltimore when that proposal was offered. With regard to these boards, to examine um, those offenses against minors as opposed to adults, I would strongly urge that they be separate. It's a different discipline uh, because in some of the cases with adults involving clerics, it could be consensual sex, anonymous, but also involve adult pornography. There's a whole different set of circumstances mm -hmm that uh, need to come into play here as it's examined and a whole different skill set mm -hmm. as well. So, I mean, they just, they love to wield the weapon of consensual, even in the case of, let's say, real life case, a 71 year old priest talking to a 17 year old. They're both adults, sure. So maybe it's consensual, give me a break, give me a break. <laughs> How is it ever consensual, ever consensual if it's a layman and a priest? ever, a Catholic layman. How is it ever consensual? You're, you're sitting there as a, uh, you know, as a, a, a layman with a man with a collar around his neck, which immediately to your psyche suggests something. Authority. Yeah, yeah authority, of course. Authority, fatherliness. I, mm -hmm. I, I mean, this, it's just so, you want to just throw something against the wall listening to this. Nothing has changed. Not a thing. Simon, what should they have done, which, I mean, talk about a missed opportunity. And that's being kind, I think, what, was actually What should deliberate. they have done? Anything but that. Yeah. I think is, I think is the ultimate, ultimate short answer. Virtually anything 
any change made to this policy would have been an improvement. And I know that people are going to go, oh, they could have done so much worse. Yes, if they had done worse, there would have been like absolute massive outcry, at which point it would have uh, c constructed something better in, in the aftermath. This is almost the perfect storm in that it's it's not any good, but it just kind of looks like it's good enough mm -hmm. so that people will, will brush it along. So. Many different things you should have done uh, with this one. Um, we spoke to uh, some people with uh, familiarity with uh, legal matters, uh, a whole bunch of people, and we've got uh, kind of uh, some suggestions here for what should happen with the National Review Board. Now, the National Review Board does exist as a thing, but it's a thing kind of without teeth. It's just sort of an advisory capacity. It really doesn't do it. So the idea, the fundamental central idea between our, our, our suggestion, of course you may disagree, but our suggestion of the National Review Board is that it is lay-led. And this is, this is kind of the key point, so there's not that issue of clericalism coming in here. So let's take a look at our little bullet points. And it's important to remember that the Pope said no laity. Mm -hmm. yep. That that no laity came directly from directly Pope Francis. From the now, a lot Francis. of bishops, of course, supported yep. it. But Pope Francis threw down that gauntlet in October at the meeting with Donardo and then Gomez and uh, Monsignor Bransfield. No, no laity. laity. So we say, yes, laity. Let's take a look at this here. So what there would be um, is that first, this uh, board would uh, have like uh, five to ten laymen, probably, with legal backgrounds. So you're talking, you know, judges, investigators, police officers, that sort of stuff. Maybe currently serving ones, maybe retired, ex-people, you know, something like that, whatever. Um, they would be appointed to four-year terms. That's very popular in the United States for public service officers, you know, and it's uh, that kind of idea is familiar. And they'd be nominated by individual bishops, but confirmed by a vote of the whole conference, everyone. And they will be paid for by the USCCB and not by individual bishops. Now, all three of those points there, the four-year terms, limited, um, confirmed by a, a large vote, and paid for by the USCCB as a whole, whole idea of that is to get rid of any sense of corruption, Option, any sense of you get embedded in your position, you get used to it, you're not beholden to a mentor or something like that. So that's the whole idea there, that there's an independence in that. They're not clerics, they're laymen, they're experts, and they uh, they have an independence. Let's take a look at uh, what uh, the uh, review board would have. So it'd have its own hotline, single phone number, and receive these allegations directly from the victims. They're not coming up through the chancery, da, 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 coming along, no, it just goes directly there. They would have investigative power. Now, obviously, in some cases, of course, these individuals would be maybe police officers, at which point they have the investigative power coming from the government there. But also, you say, no, you know what? You have investigative power that the USCCB and individual diocese gives you. You get to go, you get to come around, you get to ask questions, you get to request the records, you get to pull them in, you get to look at them. There's a, that power is granted by the individuals who have access to that information. And they'd also have the power to publicly report their findings. They would be allowed to say, you know what, we investigated, we uh, found this, we concluded this, and they would have the ability to publicly put it out on their own uh, publish uh, publication uh, venues or, again, report it to the media, something like that, so that so that people are aware of the findings. Now that, all of that is necessary in order to protect everyone, including the people accused. You know, it's, it's all very well. There was a case, my father was a teacher for many, many years, he's retired now. Back early on, one of his colleagues was accused of sex abuse and uh, the media had a field day immediately started saying, you know, this teacher, he, da 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 When it was found that every single point of that allegation about my father's friend was absolute trash, did the media come out and say, oh, it was complete trash, it was, uh, it was, no, they didn't. They left it absolutely just for years, it dogged this poor man because some, you know, nasty, uh, nasty little oik had, uh, had, had made this stuff up. That policy of saying you can publicly report the findings, that allows you to protect people who are innocent, who Absolutely. have been unfairly accused. You've got to have justice, so you've got to have fairness. So the uh, National Review Board, let's take a look at our final bullet points. They would be able to field these allegations as they came in, and they would be able to immediately report all these allegations into a shared database. So it goes to the US Nuncio, it's he kind of like, that's where the database is, but everyone has access to it. So if some priest is accused of something and it's a credible allegation and we've got all this information that's sitting there goes into a database, you can find it. So they're not hopping state lines. There's not that. Any law enforcement guy will tell you, you know, the, the biggest problem is that jurisdictional, uh, mm -hmm. when, you, when you cross a jurisdictional line and there's a lack of communication. It's always the problem. It's like, well, we didn't know. We didn't know because we didn't have that. There you go. It's a simple database to do it. 
Daily Point, immediately report any criminal activity to law enforcement. I'd actually go a little further and say everything should be reported to law enforcement. You know what? I understand the police are very, very overworked, but I think there's probably some detective downtown who is not going to mind to feel, mind fielding these calls and just saying, in this case, you know what? There's no criminal activity here. But we'll log that we've received this call. It's kind of creepy, it's kind of icky, but there's no criminal activity there. All of these things should be going to law enforcement also yeah. because it establishes a pattern, establishes a look. And uh, so that is basically where we would, we would be. They would obviously investigate the allegations as we discussed before. That is what needs to happen with this National Review Board. It's got to be lay-led. It's got to be have as much independent as you, independence as you can grant it. It's got to work hand in glove with law enforcement because these things are matters of criminality. And to be perfectly frank, while this cannot be set up on sort of a national uh, con uh, conference-wide level, an individual bishop could do this. Absolutely he could set so. this up. He could sit there and say, you know what, I, I want some volunteers from the local police department. They could come in, they could say, you know what, we're, we're going to investigate this stuff. Anything comes. He could say, this is the policy. The moment anyone calls up and says there's an allegation of sex abuse, it's like, okay, I'm going to stop you right there. Have you called the police? Because if you haven't, call them first and then call us. That needs to be it. And I, I get it. You know what? I'm making work for the boys in blue. Um, you know what? I'm potentially putting it. It's like, oh my gosh, we're going to lose control. You know what? You bishops, the, the clergy, you've had control for years and it has been a complete and utter disaster. If you recall Frank Keating, who was head of the National Review Board way back in 2000 or 2004, yeah. he, um, he actually did try to do all these things. Right. And he was essentially run out by the bishops. I mean, he quit because he was getting death threats at his house, all sorts of things happening. And he said that they were using thug tactics because they were so resistant to any of this being exposed. And now we know why, because of McCann and, and yes. other individuals like him. Right. That's exactly what it is. They're, they're protecting their own thing. Again, we've said it before. Um, if you have any knowledge of any case of abuse or any inappropriate conduct or anything like that, go to the police. Do not even bother calling the chancery. Let Absolutely. the detectives call the chancery. They can have a surprise. And if you all re recall, Delia Gallagher uh, at the sex summit challenged Cardinal Subit and all of them sitting up there saying, well, back in 2002, McCarrick was up there telling us all the same things that you're telling us now. What assurance can you give us that we can have any confidence that what you're telling us is true. And what was Subit's response? It was essentially, trust us. We're right, baptized. Right. Trust us. Right. We trust We us. live our gospel values, so just trust us. Yeah, ask yeah. Father Kalchik if uh, <laughs> Cardinal Subic <laughs> lives his gospel yeah. values. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I think th these are great suggestions. And, but I think the, the Keating uh, uh, account, that, that just, that underscores the fact that it's it, new protocol, new procedures aren't the final answer. Um, back in November at the USCCB uh, bishops meeting um, in Baltimore, uh, Bishop uh, Michael Pfeiffer, who's a Bishop Emeritus of San Angelo, Texas, he stood up and made a comment to all his brother bishops uh, about what's lacking in the discussions uh, around all of this. I thought this was a very good uh, clip. Let's take a listen. I believe we haven't given enough consideration, you mentioned it, our call to holiness. To me, at the root of all of this is a deep spiritual crisis in our church, in the bishops, in our seminaries, and so on. But unless we give more emphasis to the Holy Spirit, which I don't believe we're doing, yesterday's presentation were beautiful. I think I heard the Holy Spirit mention once. We have to get in contact with that power that Jesus promised us before he went to heaven. He said, you're going to receive power when you receive the Holy Spirit. And I don't believe we've given enough attention to the Holy Spirit in this crisis. And another factor, I don't believe we've given enough attention to the evil one, Satan. Yesterday morning, we prayed a phrase that sticks in my mind. Dear Lord, grant us your mercy and truth to free us from the snares of the devil. The devil has a powerful influence in this whole mess we're in. I don't hear him mention the devil is there. Yeah, he certainly is. A after this comment was made, there was just dead silence in the room. Typically, when, I, when a bishop would get up and, and make a comment, there would be applause afterward. 
there was just, you could have heard a pin drop after that. A little light opera applause. Right. And, right. and let's not uh, forget the fact we're having this, this topic in this show because of what happened, because of the whole string of what happened. Why? Because of all of the homosexual men that were put into the seminaries, put into the seminaries, not who matriculated in because they thought they had a calling, put into the seminaries that got this entire ball rolling and here we are. And those men, or the, the prodigy of those men, are the ones who are now in charge, who are keeping it going on. The absolute, utter silence about James Martin's homo heresy has, it tells you everything you need to know. And many bishops will be, oh, this is great, because they want to get this, even guys who disagree with that agenda, bishops, still want this past them. They're sick of hearing about it. They want to get to business as usual. Oh, just I'm sick of hearing about it. No, the laity cannot let this stop. Because the, only the laity now are going to do this. It's very clear from the Pope on down. Now, has one bishop come out and said, this is wrong? Is there one bishop that we can think of who, when this, since this thing came out, I haven't seen no, one thing. No, I have not seen anything. I haven't seen one bishop who say, no, these don't go far enough. I mean, that's, you're not challenging the Pope's spiritual authority. He, this is a prudential matter on how to handle something when a bishop can't have an opinion and say oh, the Pope's wrong. And, and the bishop, Tons of bishops had yeah. lots of opinions against John Paul yeah. and had no problem expressing those. No, and the bishop could, as I have said, he could say, you know what, these guidelines are, are guidelines and whatever, they're fine, but I want you to be calling the police as well. And he could be telling his people, if you feel this call, you call the police straight away. I don't care if they get 15 reports about the same guy. Right, and he also has the power to, to bring in the laity to help yeah. as well if he wants. Yeah, Bishop can do whatever he wants here. He's not forbidden from doing any of these extra things. He just said that's the norm. That's the norm. Well, you can make them, you know, extra norm. Mm -hmm. Extra norm. You know, the, uh, again, uh, again, it's the whole homosexual hive in the church. They've won. Uh, they continue to win until this generation of bishops pass away and, and completely are off the scene. And hope and pray that the fellows under them are, have not been trained up in the same way. Of course, I think that's why something like RICO has to happen. All of this desire to want to be in the church and be in charge and all of that and orchestrate a diocese of hundreds of millions of dollars, or in Supich's case, billions of dollars. You want to pull all this stuff away. Saint, or Saint Pope Francis wants a, uh, wants a poor church. Well, let's, let's hope get he gets down. one. Let's get down to it. Before we leave on this May 13th, why don't we offer a Hail Mary for the good of the church, especially, especially the bad bishops. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full, full of grace, grace the, the Lord, Lord is with thee. thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That's it for today. Stay close to Church Militant for all the latest news, commentary, and expert analysis that you won't hear like this anywhere else. We pull no punches so that you are the best informed you can be. For the whole crew here at Church Militant, God love you.